Welcome to Peninsula Seniors Lecture Series. Sit back, get comfortable, and let's go see what they have for us today. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to another in the weekly lecture series of the Peninsula Seniors. We're very fortunate this morning to have a prior speaker, a member of the Board of Directors of the PV Seniors, Mr. Bob Visser, who is going to share his adventures as a uh, uh, youth in Holland, in Nazi-occupied Holland. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Bob Visser. Thank you, Marty. Good morning. There's a wonderful turnout in this room. The title of my talk is Rifle Butts, Bombs, Soup, and Lice. Now you may wonder, how did I get to that title? Rifle butts that I got kicked with, bombs that seem to be falling all the time, soup, the only thing I got to eat for months, no hard uh, or real food, and then lice that I was covered with at, at the end. So that is the book that I published. So what was happening in 1944? In June 44 were the Normandy landings. Then in August of 1944 was the breakout. The Germans retreated. They retreated. Um, it was essentially chaos in the German army. Uh, a, a lot of disarray. The uh, Allied forces followed. September 5, uh, 1944, which uh, is called a Crazy Tuesday, or in Dutch, Dolle Dinsdag. Mm -hmm. What happened? Uh, the Germans had left the Netherlands. Uh, the German sympathizers had also departed, and there was a vacuum in the western part of, of the Netherlands. Everybody was out on the street, the Dutch flags were out, and we're all waiting for the Allies to come. In those days, newspapers only came out uh, uh, a couple times a week. Radios had been confiscated uh, early on in the war by the Germans, and so communication was by hearsay, and you know how rumors go. People in the streets, yes, yes, we've seen the British tanks uh, crossing the bridge. Uh, well, what had happened, of course, the, uh, the Allies, the uh, U.S. and British Army, had run out of fuel. And, and they stopped in the middle of Belgium. And that picture shows all of the supplies at that time had to come from the Normandy uh, base. Antwerp, a big port, had been taken. But the estuary towards Antwerp was still uh, partially occupied by the Germans and could not be used. So after a couple days, the Germans came back. I went back to school. I was a senior in high school at the time. And what happened next was uh, September 17, Sunday, when the, uh, an attempt was made, the uh, market garden operation, trying to take the bridges across the various river in the Netherlands trying to shorten the war. The uh, paratroopers landing at uh, Eindhoven and Nijmegen and Arnhem. Uh, they were successful in Eindhoven and Nijmegen but not at Arnhem, uh, somewhat due to uh, not very good intelligence, uh, not knowing that uh, large uh, a German battle group had just been moved north of Arnhem and uh, was put into the fight. Uh, had that been successful, the, the war would have been over six months sooner. As part of the, the effort uh, following September 17, the Dutch railroad personnel went on strike and all went into hiding. So the railroads were no longer operational which also meant that uh, food and other supplies could not come to the western part of the Netherlands, and uh, things uh, got scarce, as understatement. The, uh, 
little, little bit about what life was like under the uh, occupation. This is a poster that the uh, Germans put up. There, you can't read this. Uh, the left is German, the right is Dutch. There had been an attack on a uh, couple German soldiers by the underground. Wasn't even successful. Then the Germans uh, at, at random picked three Dutch uh, civilians, shot them, and left them on the street. And that's what this announcement uh, announces. Uh, not a thing that happened in my high school uh, at that time. Uh, it was after recess. Teacher hadn't come into the class yet. And a young man came into the room who was a former student. He graduated a couple of years earlier and walked into the classroom and said they uh, need a hiding place. The uh, Gestapo has discovered that I'm part of the underground. He showed us his pistol, pretty dangerous. And uh, I have a hiding place uh, later in the day, but I, I need uh, some shelter right now. So uh, he thought I could just sit in the class and nobody would notice him. He said, well, that's not going to work. The teacher knows all of us and will immediately recognize that you don't belong in the class. Why don't we put you in the closet? It was a shallow closet, and he just fitted in there. He's a pretty good-sized guy. So he closed the, the, uh, the door to the closet. The teacher came in and could sense that uh, things weren't quite normal. A couple of the girls uh, couldn't keep from giggling. And so in the middle of the class, halfway during the class, he walked over to the closet, opened the door, looked in, and closed it again. I said, oh gee, this is it. He walked back to the front of the classroom and continued uh, with the class. And so at the end of the class, uh, Boris, which was his name, came out of the closet and, and left. So the uh, remarkable thing, of course, the teacher had the presence of mind to recognize this was not a prank, uh, this was for real why, why he was hiding there. And secondly, that there was nobody in the class who had, uh, was a German sympathizer who might have, uh, uh, you know, announced that this was happening. November 10 of uh, 1944, the uh, Rotterdam Roundup. What had happened uh, when the Germans retreated from France they were attacked uh, by the French underground in the rear. And they thought to prevent this from happening in the Netherlands, we'll take all of the men in the 17 to 40 year age group and cart them off to Germany or other places. And uh, Rotterdam was the first uh, city in the Netherlands that where this new policy was implemented. When they later uh, went to other cities in the Netherlands, people were forewarned and men could go into hiding. At the time, uh, the Germans from time to time had taken groups of civilians and carted them off to near the front where they had to dig trenches. Then after a couple of weeks, they were let go again and could go back home. So on the uh, uh, November 10, uh, they caught about 52,000 men in that age group from Rotterdam. And that was out of 75,000 men in Rotterdam that were in, the, in that age group. Rotterdam had a population of about 700,000. Of those 52,000, uh, about 1,000 did not come back. And uh, it was a massive effort. And they, the prisoners were all moved by, some by train, some by barge, and some actually were marched on foot to the eastern part of the Netherlands.
at the time, I was uh, living in this uh, apartment building in the southern part of uh, Rotterdam. My, uh, we had the upper two floors. Uh, my room was <laughs> hidden behind the, the tree. Obviously, this is not a picture out of 1944. Uh, about 10 years ago, I, uh, I went back and took pictures of the various places where I had been. Um, when I woke up that morning, uh, uh, there was some shooting outside. And I looked out the window, there was a tank at the, the head of the street. Uh, and then uh, the trucks with uh, loudspeakers came by announcing that every man between 17 and 40 had to move out into the street. So uh, pretty soon, two of these guys uh, knocked on the front door with their rifle butts. My father went down and was handed this order. Again, you, you can't read this, it's, it's in Dutch. What it basically said that by order of the German army, every man between 17 and 40 had to leave their home and uh, get outside in the street. If you didn't do that, uh, uh, the Germans uh, would take your furniture and set the house on fire. If you tried to resist or escape, you would be shot. There are not many pictures of what, what happened. Uh, in the upper left, uh, you see a woman with her maid. She's dressed like maids uh, used to be dressed. And they're obviously waiting for uh, somebody to come by that they, uh, that they know. And here the, uh, they have obviously found uh, or see who they were looking for and are waving uh, husband or friend uh, goodbye. Another interesting thing on this picture is the, the white bands on the trees. You know, during the entire war there was a um, total blackout. And at night, uh, walking or riding a bicycle, it was pretty difficult to see anything when there was no moon or no stars. And these white bands <laughs> around the tree uh, hopefully prevented you from walking into the tree. There's another interesting thing on this picture, and you see inside the circle, you see that individual? It's a mailman. Dutch mailmen had these great big capes and their bag was mail, could fit underneath the cape because it rains a lot in Holland. And this poor guy, mail and all, had been picked up by the Germans, uh, and mail and all, I guess, was shipped off to Germany also. Okay, what, what happened? Uh, uh, after I went outside in the street, and I should add here that uh, what my father knew, and I did not, that there was a Jewish girl in hiding on the floor below us. She had been in hiding for probably uh, one or two years. Never knew that she was there, only barely moved, probably never went outside. And so uh, my father did know, and he felt that we could not afford getting the house searched. So. Uh, then furthermore, since we thought this would only be a couple week exercise, uh, I left the house and, and went outside in the street. And then we were uh, a lot of shooting and shooting in the air and herded in groups to the corner of the street and then marched to a, a soccer field. And there were thousands of us on you know, the soccer field, first lined up in groups of 100 and then different arrangements. And then we heard some shots, and I didn't see this, but there was a, a Dutch uh, reserve officer who came in his uniform, and I said, under the Geneva Convention, uh, I do not have to go with these civilians. I should be taken as a prisoner of war. So they shot him and killed him. And like I say, I didn't see this, but uh, the story uh, made the rounds and kept us well under control. After standing in the rain all day, uh, we were marched to the docks and placed in uh, 
Nicole Barge. That, that's a more recent picture. Uh, that's what one of these barges looked like. Um, there were seven or eight holes, 18 by 30 feet each, and uh, there was a wooden ladder going into the hold, and about 120 men were crammed into one of these holes in the space of about 18 by 30 feet. Obviously, no bathroom there. The only way you, you we could be in there is by either standing or hunched up. And uh, for two days, I was in there. Uh, the bathroom was a corner. It was about an inch of coal dust on the floor. So uh, it was pretty miserable. For a total of 10 days, I, I was in, uh, in these coal barges. We were first stopped in Amsterdam, were offloaded, got some soup, put back in the barges, moved to the little town of Kampen, and then from there to the town of Zwolle, both in the eastern part of the Netherlands. In, in Kampen, we were again uh, offloaded from the uh, barges and lined up on the dock and in, in a long column moved into a former Dutch army uh, barracks. It was about a four or five story buildings. At that time, uh, German paratroopers uh, were the guards, and they'd been told that we were dangerous terrorists. And <laughs> to encourage us to move fast at every half landing, they were there with their rifle butts, uh, encouraging, us, encouraging us to, to move faster. While, while on the dock, uh, uh, one of the uh, German officers noted a a Jewish uh, gentleman, he had his uh, Star of David, uh, the, the yellow Star of David on his, uh, on his overcoat, shot him and dumped him in the river. Again, these things made, made an impression. There was also uh, a funny incident. Uh, uh, my uh, classmate, Wim Snydoat, we, we were sort of together, and he was just behind me and a German army captain, captain thought that he wasn't moving fast enough and was going to give him a kick in his behind. Well, Wim sensed this and moved out of the way, and the German army captain kept rotating. He got very upset, grabbed his gun, and uh, started shooting in the air, fortunately. Uh, in Zwolle, uh, we, again, we spent several days in these barges and uh, very little food and well, I got very thirsty, so I, I was picked. Uh, it was a little detail of six people to get some pails of water from the, uh, one of the adjacent homes uh, on shore. So one, uh, one German guard with six prisoners and a pail went to this home and filled up the pail with water. Well, next thing we know, there were only five of us, five prisoners. One guy had taken off. <laughs> The German guard, he was a, a little bit older, and he, his first inclination was to shoot all of us, and we talked him out of that. And then, fortunately, we found uh, the, uh, the sixth guy, he was hiding behind a bush, and uh, then we convinced the guard not to tell his superiors because it would not look bad on, it would look bad on him if he'd let one of us escape. So. The incident uh, passed without uh, any further reper repercussions. Then we were uh, uh, marched uh, to the railroad station and all poured into a train. This was one of these trains where uh, each compartment had its own door. And I think there were uh, 12 of us in this compartment. There was maybe room for 10. A German officer came, came by, counted us, and in crayon wrote the number of people in the compartment with big letters on the door. And he said if uh, at future stops there are fewer people in the compartment, the rest will be shot. Again, that made an impression. Uh, the train left and for three days it wandered through Western Germany. Didn't get any food. It was obvious they, they didn't know what to do with us. Uh, 
we circled around. At, at one night, we were put on a siding, the engine left, and uh, there was an aerial attack, and it hit the train behind us, which was full of Russian uh, prisoners. And so we all got out of the train on a hill, pitch dark. Uh, first thought of escaping uh, came up, but we didn't know where we were and, uh, and what to do. Uh, a lot of wounded Germans, uh, Russians around. So after a while, the guards uh, herded us up and we all went back in the train and the next morning the train continued and uh, ended up in an area where we didn't want to be, in the, uh, the Ruhr Center, the, uh, the industrial heart of, uh, of Germany. And so we were uh, offloaded uh, in a town uh, by the name of Mülheim, right in the middle of the Ruhr Center and uh, split up in groups, small groups, 20 or 40. And my particular group was uh, sold, quote unquote, to a prefab concrete manufacturer in, in Mulheim. So for the, the next uh, several weeks, I was a slave laborer building uh, concrete, uh, prefab concrete uh, components that uh, uh, barracks could be built with, and this, of course, for the, uh, the German war effort. During the day, the U.S. Air Force bombed, and at night, the Royal Air Force bombed. So it was a uh, continuous, ongoing air raid alarms. The, uh, we were housed in a uh, burned-out barrack, uh, where there was a very good uh, air raid shelter. So at night, we were, uh, when there was acute alarm, we were uh, well sheltered. During the day, there was not such a good shelter, but it was a bit outside the city uh, where we were working, and so uh, no, we could see uh, the two adjacent towns, how they were being bombed during the, during the day, but uh, nothing that, that fell close to us. Right away, uh, Snydode and I, my friend Snydode, classmate, said, uh, hey, we don't like it here, let's go back. We, <laughs> one thing we wanted to do, we wanted to get back to school. Uh, the type of Dutch high school that we attended at the end of the year, end of the senior year, there was a nationwide exam and if you passed that, you could go to any university. If you didn't pass that, you had to redo the entire year. Obviously, we, uh, we didn't want to redo the year. Uh, we needed some money. We converted the Dutch money we had into uh, German marks. Uh, people in those days uh, rolled their own cigarettes, and cigarette paper was not available, so they used uh, uh, newspaper, uh, pieces of newspaper, not very hygienic. I had a pad of airmail paper, which I cut up in the exact size and sold those for a mark per hundred and generated a fair amount of money that way. We needed some contact addresses in the Netherlands. We got those uh, where we could hide or where people could help us. Then we planned a route, uh, a, bit, a bit naive. We planned to uh, walk to the Dutch border from, uh, from where we were. And then uh, we figured we could not cross by highway because there would be a border post. But if we followed the railroad, there shouldn't be any, uh, any gates or anything there. So the plan was to go to a town near the Dutch border and then walk uh, along the railroad tracks into the Netherlands. Uh, so the, another thing we did, we changed uh, one of our uh, fellow prisoners had been put to work in an office where he had a typewriter and he was able to change our birth dates from 1926 to 1928. So it looked like we were two years younger thinking once we got in the Netherlands, we didn't meet the 17 to 40 age group anymore. Uh, there were no guards where we were, but uh, in order to travel into, in Germany, 
you needed a, a, a permit, and obviously we didn't have a permit, so we planned to travel without those permits. So that was the plan, pretty naive, walk to the border and then somehow or another get back to Rotterdam. That's of course uh, uh, part of the plan still. We were to be deloused on a Saturday, which meant we didn't work that day. We did not work on Sundays, and so we planned to leave very early on Sunday morning, like at 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning. Take a streetcar to the next town, then walk to the Dutch border, follow the railroad, find shelter with the underground, and get back to Rotterdam. Well, it didn't quite go as we had planned. Uh, it started right away. The streetcar uh, was stomped by a bomb crater that ha happened the night before. We started walking and promptly got lost in the dark. By the time it got daylight, we could orient ourselves. And by that time, we also got out of the uh, industrial areas. And we're out in the open and we're pretty conspicuous. Uh, on the Sunday, all the Ger well-dressed Germans and we're in a pair of tattered coveralls and uh, with some luggage. So we decided, uh, besides I already was tired of walking after a couple hours, we decided we better start using the train. So in the little town of Dinslark, and, uh, we, uh, we switched to train level uh, uh, travel. We were in this little town of Dinslark, and when we made that decision and uh, got to the railroad station, we got there about 11 o'clock in the morning, the next train to the city of Wesel was not until 2 o'clock, so we moved into the waiting room, bought a cup of uh, Erzatz coffee, which was terrible, and sat there, read a little bit, and, and dozed, and all of a sudden I saw two German military police come into the waiting room and started checking everybody's papers. I, I woke uh, Willem up, and fortunately we were last in the waiting room, and we concocted a little story. And let me read uh, <laughs> what the conversation went. The, the, the two German uh, military police came up to us and said, uh, hello, maybe please see your travel doc documents. We don't have travel permits, only our Dutch identity papers. Yes, but you must have travel permits. No, we don't have them yet. We only arrived in Germany a few days ago, and the employment office has not had time to give them to us. Oh, really? And where do you think you're going? And the soldier looked straight in my eyes, and without blinking or hesitation, I responded, we have the day off, and we're going to some friends in Wesel. Brief silence, fraught with suspense, and then he handed us our, our Dutch identity papers back and said, responded, well, I guess that's all right then. Auf Wiedersehen. <laughs> <laughs> now, could we speak German? And, and this is again uh, to the credit of the uh, Dutch educational system. Uh, throughout the high school years, uh, not only did we have Dutch, we had German, we had French and English. In fact, I started French when I was still in grade school. You know, the Netherlands is a small country. You go 50 miles any direction, you have to start speaking a different language. So by this time, I, uh, my German was good. Uh, in fact, I later claimed I spoke better than the Germans. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we, we, we crossed this uh, particular uh, incident. By this time, it was 2 o'clock. The train had already arrived, and uh, we, we ran to the platform. The train had just started moving. And this was another train where each compartment had its own door. And so as it was moving, we grabbed the door and entered the compartment. It was full of SS officers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I should mention, you know, the, the, the German uh, military police wore this strange uh, gadget uh, around their neck. Uh, they called it a, a, a gorget. So that shows the uh, compartment full of uh, <laughs> German officers. We didn't know what to do, so we sat down and we started playing a game of Minesweeper. Anyway, we got to Wesel. It was still uh, bright daylight. 
and the next train to Bocholt, where we wanted to go, was not until 7 p.m. And so we need to uh, stay out of the way. We're, we weren't about to go sit in a waiting room at the railroad station, not after that uh, first experience. Again, we were rather conspicuous in the, in the streets, and, and we saw a, a couple Italian workers who obviously were heading for a bar. We followed them, and indeed, they were on their way to a bar, and so we spent uh, the time um, drinking a couple of beers in the Zumblauahana bar, or the, uh, the Blue Rooster. Then uh, went back to the railroad station, again brought round-trip tickets to make it believable. Then when we got to Bohol, there was an air raid r alarm, so everything pitch dark. Uh, we moved to the, uh, we walked to the, the front of the train, and uh, when the platform ended, I couldn't see anything. I fell off on a metal plate, which made a lot of record, but nothing happened. Then we started walking uh, along, the, along the tracks. Again, this is a picture I took uh, much later. But we walked uh, uh, along, the, uh, along the tracks there, headed across that little bridge. The engine followed us, but uh, uh, fortunately we weren't quite there yet, otherwise we would have had to jump in the water. And so we walked and walked, and uh, there was a split in the tracks, and we gambled on using the right one. Then uh, all of a sudden we saw barbed wire on both sides of the tracks. And then we saw a watchtower. And <laughs> we just crept foot by foot, kept going. It was a clearing. And Vim, of course, hit a, an empty can, lots of noise, but no lights came on and, and nobody started shooting. We walked right through the middle of a prisoner of war camp, Starlock 6F, which had been empty for three days and had, then was empty for a few more days. But right at that time, it was empty. And it was, it was one of those watchtowers. So then uh, all of a sudden, the track stopped. And so we figured, well, we've gone the wrong way. Uh, we found a ditch and uh, <laughs> hunker down in the ditch and say we'll, we'll rest here until morning, find out where we were, where we are, and then continue. Now, I saw a lot of light flashes in the distance. This was December 17, 1944. It was the day the Battle of the Bulge started, uh, which in a way was fortunate for us. Uh, so we, we spent the night in the ditch. The next morning we passed a couple farmhouses on this uh, uh, road through the woods and they looked curiously at us, but we thought we were still in Germany, so we didn't do. They went across a high, highway and were intercepted by a German soldier. <laughs> we tried to tell him that we were taking a morning walk prior to going to work. He didn't believe that. He asked us uh, uh, for directions. Well, we didn't know where we were. We gambled, but that was the wrong way. And so he uh, he arrested us and took us back to the border. We were several miles inside the Netherlands. And took us back to a border post, and then under armed guard, we were moved, walked back to, uh, to Bocholt first had an interrogation by the Gestapo, and he didn't like one of my smart allocate comments, and got behind his, from behind his deck, grabbed me and pummeled me, and I ended up in the corner. Then we were placed in a, in a cell. It was not a very big cell, about nine by nine. And initially two of us, just a bed and a commode, and at the end of the, f we stayed in there for five days, and at the end of the five days, there were nine of us, uh, eight of us Dutch and one Russian. Uh, at the end of the f five days, uh, in, in the meantime, we had several more interrogations uh, by both the police and the, and the Gestapo trying to 
make sure that we had the straight story. And then we were released uh, to the uh, SA. The, the SA was where the, the German brown shirts, the uh, uh, German stormtroopers, they'd been pressed into service as guards uh, of work camps. So this, this was a picture of the uh, downtown Bocholt. The, uh, the Gestapo was housed in that building on the left. At the time, the, the square was called the Hermann Goering Platz. The street sign now says St. George Platz. They wisely were named uh, the square after the war. This was the barracks where we stayed in, in, in Bocholt. And then looked at a nice den. There were probably about three or four hundred men on the upper floor, on the, uh, on the bare floor with some straw. Uh, again, no guards. Uh, we had a roll call uh, every morning, and we were split in groups of, of ten, and with the threat that if uh, one of the ten had disappeared, the other nine would be shot. Never tested that. Uh, while there, we had to, uh, that was one of the SR guys, uh, the, the, the leader, uh, Thousandschaft Führer was, was his uh, the title. They were bastards. What we did during this period uh, was dig trenches uh, for the, uh, what the Germans called the Westfalen defense line. We cut trees, and I, I developed a bad case of dysentery, and most of the time, I was actually unable to work. Uh, spent some time in a clinic, which was uh, outside the camp in a bar uh, run by a Dutch medical student. Uh, one of our problems was we didn't have blankets. We'd left those uh, in, uh, in Milheim. And uh, while in the, in the clinic, uh, I got little passes so we could walk for an hour in the, in the town. And during one of those walks, I, I went to the railroad station and looked at the railroad schedule and discovered I could go all the way back in, if I left very early in the morning and come back the same day. So uh, while uh, in the camp, uh, Vim would cover for me by telling the guards that I had to go back to the, to the clinic because I didn't show up that morning. And, uh, you know, we were so cold on the bare floor because floor, the, the, the winter of 44 to 45 was an extremely cold winter in, in Western Europe. So, uh, indeed, I, I, I took three, three trains and a streetcar to get back to the camp. Our stuff was still there. The, uh, the, the uh, camp manager, fortunately, didn't see me. And so I picked up her stuff and, and went back uh, uh, and detected and went back into the camp. Uh, it was a little delay because of an air raid alarm that uh, I made it back uh, late at night. Then uh, that was one of those passes uh, that I had so that a, this one uh, authorized me to actually to stay inside the camp and not have to work outside with similar passes I had so I could walk around an hour. So then uh, uh, one afternoon it was announced that we were moving to another location for a few days, quote unquote. So that night we were marched to the railroad station. Of course there was another air raid alarm and uh, it was not just our camp, but a whole bunch of other camps. And there was one second class railroad car in the trains, which was obviously intended for the guards. Well, the dark day missed that. And my particular group was pushed in the second class railroad car. And by the time we were in there and the alarm was over, the train left, it was too late to evict us from there. The train moved uh, to, the, to the front, uh, past Cologne. The train stopped for a while at the Cologne railroad station, and Cologne had been uh, pretty well destroyed by that time. And then the train continued on to the little town of Quadrath Eschendorf. It was fortunately an uh, overcast day, so there were no air raids. This uh, slide shows the then front line 
along the Ruhr River. The Germans had uh, blown up the dams, and so the, the whole Ruhr River area had flooded. The uh, hashed line on the left uh, is the border with the Netherlands, between Germany uh, and, the, and the Netherlands. Uh, the town of Aachen, which was uh, one of the first towns in Germany to be uh, occupied by the uh, U.S. Army. Then we were halfway between Cologne and the front line. There were about 20 divisions massed uh, on, the, uh, on uh, our side of the Ruhr River, and the Germans had a uh, complete army on the other side. So all ready for the final offensive to start into Germany. This was mid-February 1945. The, uh, I forgot to mention early, w earlier when we were in the, uh, in the prison in Bocholt, the, uh, the Battle of the Bulge was ongoing, had just started, and the German guards were ecstatic. They thought they were going to reverse the course of the war a breakthrough to Antwerp, and the Allies would sue for peace, and uh, the Germans and the Allies would jointly start fighting the Russians. Well, fortunately, that didn't come about. Anyway, uh, so now we're close to the front. Two hundred of us were placed in this in a former dance hall. Half of the two hundred men had lice, and they crawled ac across at night. And so I spent uh, several hours at night trying to catch them. And <laughs> there was only one urinal and one toilet and one faucet. Uh, we got a pint of watery soup and a chunk of bread just once a day. That was all the food. And when, once you get hungry, you start hallucinating about food. And I remember, uh, you know, during the day, I started hallucinating about these wonderful meals that I would get somewhere. Uh, again, we were dealing, digging trenches, uh, building tank barricades, and fixing roads. And there were continual attacks when the weather was clear. The, uh, that's a picture of the uh, that grim-looking building where the dance hall was. By the time I took this picture, it, was, it is now a, uh, a, a mosque, Turkish mosque. And the uh, layout on the floor was pretty much as we were sleeping because there wasn't that much room. We were uh, head to toe uh, spread out on the floor. There had been some, some dirty straw, and I moved that out of the way. Now, there used to be a podium at the head where the, the German guards had a machine gun that overlooked us. Uh, one night, Trigger, happy guy, let, let, let loose. Uh, fortunately, didn't, didn't hit anybody. Then when it was clear, uh, the fighter pilots uh, were uh, continuously uh, strafing and bombing uh, where we were. Let me tell you that uh, uh, the first morning, we, we got to the, the workplace about 7 or 8 o'clock, and the, uh, the U.S. Air Force didn't start that early. They came about 9 o'clock. Let me tell you, I started digging that trench very, very quickly to have some shelter. When, when it wasn't clear weather, it was raining, and uh, we all got wet and had no opportunity to change our clothing, so it, it was a pretty miserable time. Uh, this is one of those, a picture of one of those tank barricades that we, uh, that we built. We, we used to say it'll take... Uh, the Americans, uh, an hour and five minutes to, uh, to break them down, an hour to quit laughing, and five minutes to uh, push it out of the way. Didn't take them five minutes. They, uh, they were tree trunks that were planted into the, to the, the ground next to the road. They were supposed to be filled up with railroad uh, rails. There was one uh, funny incident. Uh, we were almost finished with one. And, uh, German tank captain came, got his measuring tape out. I said, whoops, it's got to be taken down again. It's too narrow. The German tanks can't get through. <laughs> we laughed. 
This is a railroad overpass in the city of Kodash, Ischendorf. On February 14th, a day that I uh, well remember, right about noon, we were working on a tank battery, uh, on a tank uh, uh, barricade on one end, uh, when a train stopped right, right on top of the, uh, of the overpass. And within minutes, the first bomb fell. And there was a utility corridor inside the, uh, the overpass. And we all ran and managed to get in there. The train was t full of ammunition, uh, 40 centimeter shells. And when this was over, it took a couple hours. The railroad engine had rolled off the embankment, was in a ditch, and each and every car had exploded. Some of the shells had rolled down the embankment. Uh, if that uh, utility corridor hadn't been there, uh, I would not have been sitting here. That was an eerie experience. That's uh, my, my work of art showing what, what happened there. Towards the end of this period, uh, all of a sudden at night, uh, we were told uh, we're going to move to another location. And so we started walking through the fields in a long column and uh, got to a next town, Niederend, where we were supposed to be quartered. But there was only room for, uh, was it an auction hall? There was only room for uh, half of us or even less than half. And so those who were infirm or couldn't walk any former, further could stay there. I was one of the 70. I, by this time, my feet were bleeding, the uh, inadequate shoes that I had. Uh, and so I stayed around. My buddy Snydot uh, kept on and went, went with the rest of the group. During that night, the Ruhr Offensive started a massive, massive artillery bombardment. Shells were flying over the auction hall and exploding into the little city. Uh, it was one of the, the uh, most massive aerial or artillery bombardments of the war, I, I later learned. Uh, in the morning, uh, the guards said, does uh, any of the group here have any experience baking? I had visions of bread. Raised my hand. All 70 of them raised their hands. <laughs> well, I was convincing enough, and 10 of us, including me, were picked to become bakers. So <laughs> the next morning, I. Uh, Turned out it was for the German army. The enthusiasm uh, dropped a little bit, but I figured anything is better than one of those SA uh, bastards. And so the, we were picked up by a, a, a German sergeant, army sergeant, and uh, walked to the next town, Berendorf, and um, quartered in a home. Then in the afternoon, uh, we were told that uh, the uh, bakery, army bakery, was evac being evacuated, half of it, and moved further back away from the front, because we could hear the shooting. It was getting pretty close. Uh, I didn't want to leave. I figured uh, this little town close to the front, uh, the end would, would come very rapidly. So we drew lots. And uh, I was one of the five that uh, had to move back with the bakery and moved us to uh, further away from the front, the town of Oberhausen. We were quartered, uh, the five of us, in uh, the upper floor of this school, house, school building, schoolhouse. Uh, again, the, the, the building was obviously uh, not occupied at that time. And so the next morning, I started my first effort as a baker. I had to carry a tray with, uh, with dough from where it had been cut to the oven. I wasn't strong enough. I dropped the whole thing. And so then I was uh, 
put in charge of cutting chunks of dough. So I did that one morning. Uh, then uh, the next day, uh, before I started baking again, there was uh, the sergeant uh, came down and said, well, the bakery is going to move further back again and uh, be prepared to, to move back, so pick up all your, all your stuff. So I walked uh, back down, and right at that time, uh, another big artillery bombardment started, and everybody started hiding, and with another Dutchman, young, I started running away, and there were shrapnel flying all around us. They may have been shooting at us, but I, I didn't stop to look. And we walked uh, down the st uh, past the, the schoolhouse and uh, kept on walking. They were all half-destroyed homes, but we didn't have the guts to, to hide there. Uh, but at the, the end of the road, there was a air raid shelter across from the power plant. And it was a very elaborate uh, uh, shelter. There were about 30 or 40 Germans, civilians in there. And we joined them. They, they looked uh, strange at us, but didn't have the guts to put us out again. And so there was a bench that uh, became our, our home for the next several days. Muddy floor. We hid in this uh, uh, air raid shelter for uh, three days. Uh, by the, the last day, uh, there was a lot of mortar firing back and forth. And uh, again, there was no bathroom uh, in the place. So during a lull in the fighting, I went outside uh, top of the uh, little hill. And while there, uh, a mortar shell landed close to me and I got some shrapnel in my lower body and also in my hands. I, I uh, uh, didn't look all that serious and I had some bandages and patched it up. Then uh, uh, five German soldiers came into the air raid shelter and said uh, they had orders to defend the area. <coughs> and I talked to them and said, hey, uh, you know, pretty stupid what you're doing. The war is lost. And they were ready to surrender. And so they agreed uh, that uh, they would surrender. And I, I told them I could speak English and, and help you. And uh, a lot of pamphlets had been dropped saying that if you, uh, you wanted to surrender or you had to loudly shout, we surrender. So about uh, 4.30 uh, uh, that afternoon, the, uh, the door to the shelter was kicked open and the machine gun sprayed inside. I got one bullet in a, in a backpack and one of the German soldiers had a bullet in his knee. So I told him, I shout, we surrender, we surrender. And they shouted, we're a Gabenons, we're a Gabenons. And then I marched them outside. <laughs> <laughs> the GIs uh, got a big kick out of that and started playing Santa Claus with food and cigarettes. and. Report from the Third Armored Division, which is, was the uh, division that uh, came through Oberhausen, it was the 104th Infantry Division, and the Third Armored. And two task forces uh, crossed the Erft River, and and struck at the strongly defended town of Oberhausen at 1615. And in the three hours, the town was in their hands. Uh, it was pretty hard fighting in that little town. Oh, this is a, I picked this up out of the mud, the uh, Stars and Stripes. Some of you may recall the uh, Army newspaper from those days. It uh, suffered a little bit from the mud, but I, I kept it. The, um, I found a bicycle and uh, decided uh, the, the wound was getting infected and I needed to go see a doctor. So I figured I could uh, cycle to the nearest Dutch town, which was Roermond. Uh, and uh, I collapsed, and a couple American soldiers uh, picked me up. And after they discovered that I wasn't German, they took me to 
uh, evacuation hospital uh, where first aid and then I was moved to a larger military uh, hospital in Eschweiler and from there by ambulance to a hospital in Belgium, Verviers, Belgium. That was the, uh, uh, stayed in Verviers a uh, couple months. The, the, the Netherlands, the, or Rotterdam, the northern part of the Netherlands was still occupied, so I, I couldn't go anywhere. After about a week, I could walk again, and uh, really had a marvelous time in this uh, little town of Verviers. Uh, this was the auxiliary hospital, it had been a, uh, a girls' school and had been converted into a hospital for uh, people like me. Uh, that's what I looked like. Uh, and one at that time still had a injured finger. Another picture of uh, what I looked like that time. In May, middle of May, at, after the war had ended, I went to the town of Rumont where uh, I had family friends. Uh, in fact, decided to go back to school. Uh, I think only did that a couple days and then it was announced that my class year would not have to take the exam. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only, only year in history in the Netherlands that uh, you didn't have to do that uh, exam. What a relief. <laughs> <laughs> then on, on, uh, in early June, I managed to get back to Rotterdam. Uh, a lot of people always ask, well, what happened to my buddy? He continued on. The town that uh, he ended up in, uh, was more severely hit than where I was. Several of the group that he was with, including one of the guards, were either injured or, or hurt or killed. And he was eventually marched back across the Rhine, uh, then also escaped and walked all the way back to Rotterdam. Uh, he was more dead than alive when he got home. We lost track of each other and uh, ten years ago, I tracked him down, and then <laughs> we told a lot of stories. <laughs> so then uh, this year, we, uh, we saw each other again. And interestingly enough, I got interviewed this year by the uh, Peninsula News. He got interviewed, picture on the left, by the local newspaper. He had also written a diary, obviously in Dutch, and had it reprinted uh, this year. So that's the story. Thank you for watching Peninsula Senior Lecture Series. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.